short while in the late 60s that Jimi Hendrix Experience was the most popular touring band on earth with record sales to match. It should have made multi-millionaires of its three members, guitarist Jimi Hendrix, drummer Mitch Mitchell, and bass player Noel Redding. But they saw precious little of the vast fortune they earned, even after Hendrix's untimely death in 1970. What was arguably the biggest rock and roll rip-off in history began in October 1966, when the lads signed up with a pair of managers called Michael Jeffrey and Chaz Chandler, who'd formerly played bass with another of the 60s biggest groups, The Animals. At that stage, says Noel Redding, the Hendrix band was as green as grass and dazzled by promises of fame and fortune. Well, a very young guy in those days. <laughs> Being 20 years old and sort of joining a band and having all the, uh, we're going to be big talk, you know, sort of stuff, like telly and recording studios, etc. And um, we signed a contract, which I later found out, well, it took me 11 years to find the contract, actually, that um, they owned everything. Your manager? Yeah, management. And we were earning 15 quid a week. Uh, and going into the spring of 67 when Hey Joe got to number two and we were sort of just booked for the Walker Brothers tour. I then found out we were earning between maybe two and four hundred quid a night, a night, which is like we were working seven nights a week. And that's without doing the interview in the morning at nine, the photo session at 10.30, <laughs> the TV show in the afternoon, then up to the gig, you know, 15 quid a week. On behalf of the band, Noel pointed out that this was hardly fair, but Geoffrey and his lawyers said that tours were expensive things to run and that anyway, most of the money was going into a Bahamas-based management company called Yamita Limited, which would look after it on the band's behalf. Because we trusted all these people. And as we were told that all the money... I was saying, where's the money? Oh, it's being sent to Nassau lads. You know, like, um, you want us to pay tax, man. Oh! Lovely. When did we get it? Oh, don't worry. You know. <laughs> Grossing a lot of money. Our last tour of America in '69. We did just over a month. And looking at the papers earlier, we grossed 1.2 million dollars, right, between three people. I never saw a penny of it. Not a penny. And that just disappeared. And I still don't know where it's gone. These days, Noel and his girlfriend, Carol, live in a crumbling farmhouse in the west of Ireland, eking out a living playing in clubs and pubs. The gold and platinum discs that line the walls of Knowles Hallway are a daily reminder of the cynical and relentless way the experience was. Six long weeks on the road, they packed out one of the biggest indoor concert venues in the world, Madison Square Garden earning for their managers on just one night 16 years ago the lion's share of gate receipts in excess of a hundred thousand dollars at that point um, i think i was probably still drawing maybe 200 bucks a week so that was probably meant i did the gardens for like maybe 40 dollars or something you know <laughs> and um then like further investigation which i did as you can see you know like, um these monies were going to like companies in the Bahamas and companies in uh, Curacao and upon investigation and searching as you know like um, I found out that Yamita company was owned by Keokos Trust, care of the Bank of Nova Scotia, care of the Bank of New Providence, all these little islands in Nassau you know well the Bahamas and that was like the American world is I think um, the French royalties were going to Curacao to some company called Sons and Rainbow, which was formed by Michael Jeffrey at some point. And um, I investigated that company, and that was owned by Keokos Investments Limited, which was all then owned by Keokos, um, 
You look a bit confused. Do you think that was perhaps the purpose of it? Well, it... It could have been, you know, you know. Have Sorry. you yet found where the money's gone? No. How long really. have you been looking? Um... Sixteen years, I think. How much do you think the group lost, first of all, and then you personally? Um... Well, to date, since Hendrix died, the estate of Hendrix has earned um, approximately $80 million. Um, and previous to that, I, I wouldn't know, you know, but um, I'd say that I probably lost maybe about six mil. Six million pounds? Yeah. And then, like, for example, another thing, like, the band, as it was called, made three albums, right? And then, this is what has come out since. After Hendrix is dead? Yes. We gather there's, um... How many are there? I don't know how many is there exactly, but I gather there's 84 albums on the market now. You know, and what have you earned out of those? Box set. Nothing. Not a penny. Initially, Noel did get royalties from two of his own songs, which have since been deleted from the flood of posthumous albums. He got no British record royalties, no TV royalties, and little or no concert revenue. But after Hendrix's death, Noel naively thought all this would be settled. After Hendrix's death, I thought, well, I'll get my 25% of the royalties. And then um, suddenly the estate of Hendrix took over. And I said, where's my 25%? They said, who are you? I said, well, I'm the bass player. They said, prove it. Which these days, he can't. Many of those reassembled and re-released albums have had his bass playing efforts removed and redubbed by session musicians. What little money he did have, the result of a personal out-of-court settlement in his favour, has been spent in a fruitless legal battle to recover his money. He now thinks the management company Yumita was the funnel through which much of his potential fortune disappeared. But the trail leads round and round in circles, with everyone blaming everyone else and eventually pointing the finger at Michael Jeffrey, who is now, conveniently, dead, though his body has never been found. Noel's been reduced to earning a few pounds a night, playing in pubs and clubs in West Cork. He can't afford to carry on with the costly legal action necessary to recover what is his by right. I spent about £70,000, £80,000 trying to get my role to, and forget it. That's because right at the start, he naively signed away his rights in what he now describes as a contract which sold him body and soul to his original managers, Michael Jeffrey and Chaz Chandler. It's really music and soul contract. <laughs> it's in your body. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, Jeffrey's, uh, from what I've gathered, uh, subsequent to me splitting with uh, the boys, uh, was always trying to get them saying one piece of paper after the other. The more bit, under the theory, the more bits of paper there was, the more confusing it was. But some of these bits of paper have your name on them. Yeah, they have my name on them, but they don't have my signature. And this one in particular, I've never seen before myself in my life. Uh, it says here that I'm part of this contract, but it has no signature of mine on it. And uh, I would say it's a spurious contract. There are some contracts, though, which do have what purports to be your signature on them. Uh, yeah, I've seen them ones as well. Uh, very poor forgeries by Meg Jeffries, in fact. Uh, on two of them I've seen it said, it just says B.J. Chandler, and then signed by Meg Jeffries actually admits he signed it, so... What I mean, sort of a man was Mike Jeffrey then? He had a very convoluted mentality, he was like an idiot genius, you know, uh, and he got more thrill out of stealing a pound than earning a pound, you know. And it wasn't until he had, had actually parted company altogether from uh, both Jimmy and Mike that uh, you started, to become, started becoming more aware of uh, the deviousness of his... Uh, the way his brain flowed, <laughs> devious bugger. But you were owed a considerable sum of money. Where do you think all the money that he siphoned out, you seem to be saying, went? Uh, my memory is he used to shove an awful lot of it into Spain. He, had, he was involved in clubs and things in Spain. Uh, and I don't know, I, I, you know, he, he got into some... Uh, one of the reasons why I split with Jimmy and Mike is that they had some crackpot scheme of getting mercenaries together and taking over Papa Doc's Island. So, I mean, money could have been... Dis you know, this sounds crazy, but this is where they, they were coming from at that time. 
Mind you, it is a bit convenient, isn't it, to make Geoffrey the villain because he's dead. Ah, yeah, you can do that if you like. Go look for another villain, but you're not fine anymore. The millions really began rolling in after Hendrix had died, but the surviving members of the band got next to nothing. Ironically, Noel, who'd lived to play another day, got ripped off all over again. That goes further. About 74, I had this band called the Noel Wedding Band. I was introduced to these uh, managers in brackets in London called John Brewer and Robert Patterson and um, by a lawyer from America and you know, all very nice and I thought, well, I'm, I should try and trust someone again, you know, after all this rubbish because I was very paranoid and uh, they got me a deal with RCA. It was a very good band, you know, and um, we went in, recorded and sort of did tour, did a ten week tour of America and then suddenly like there was no money the same story again and I found out they'd taken three hundred and sixteen thousand dollars from RCA in advances on behalf of the band and um, we went to the high court in London they had barristers everywhere you know like you know it was amazing we were there for five days in the high court and they said right okay we'll settle right RCA even sent me a bill saying they can sue me for $316,000. I said, well, I haven't got it. They've got it, you know. So, settlement, they're supposed to do that, and that was in 1978. And them guys are still in London doing business. Noel was not alone in being taken to the cleaners by Patterson and Brewer. Others involved in his settlement only got paid as a result of still further court action, and some didn't get paid at all. After them came Jerry Rafferty, who got stung during the production of his mega-hit album, City to City. He too had to go to court to get his just desserts. Patterson and Brewer's business record strikes an all-too-familiar chord time and time again. Yet other creditors have had to resort to company winding up orders and bankruptcy proceedings in order to get paid. Hello, uh, Mr. Patterson. My name is Roger Cook from Central Television. Oh, yeah. I'm here to ask you some questions about how you leave bands in the lurch, why you didn't meet a settlement Noel Redding got against you. Uh, I've already sent a telex to somebody in your company. No, I'd like to have an answer from you personally, please. Robert Patterson doesn't like being asked to account for himself. He seems to prefer to walk away from his problems. From these Chelsea premises, he and Brewer now run a company called Avatar Communications, which shares the appalling financial reputation of his previous companies, some of which collapsed owing hundreds of thousands of pounds. Why also do other people have to wind up your companies to get paid, to threaten bankruptcy well, proceedings? Well, then you're in a better... you know more about Norway's position than I do. No, we're talking about other people, other artists. I'm, Road uh, managers who had to uh, threaten to wind your, or wind your company up in order to get paid. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Jerry Rafferty, who had trouble. He got the gold disc in there, but... Uh, I don't think there's any problems with Jerry. Well, there are a number of problems with a lot of people. You don't have a particularly good reputation, do you, Mr. Patterson? Uh, so you're telling me? Well, I... so lots of people tell us. Oh, OK. Anyway, I don't want to talk about it any further. I don't know what you're trying to do, and best of luck with it. Right, go do it to somebody else because it's ridiculous. Well, we're told you're the guy who deserves it. Well, that's just what you're told. I, I don't know. Okay, so can you leave my premises, please? Are you going to do something about Mr. Redding's problem? Are you going to do something about cleaning up your act? The court was satisfied that there would be a settlement which you would agree to keep. It hasn't been kept. Well, I'm not aware of that. That's what I keep telling you. And you keep asking me if I have an answer, and I keep telling you that I'm not aware of it. You obviously have a lot more about me than I do. Right? So, that's it. Okay? But none of that, unfortunately, helps Noel Redding very much. Without money to pursue the matter, Patterson and Brewer can hold out against him forever. I'd have to sue them again. Again. To enforce the settlement. Which I can't afford to do. <laughs> so how do you feel about that? Oh. I'm rather bitter, you know, that's like, not as bitter as like the, um, that lot, you know, the experience thing. That, that's like, I'd say, chicken feed compared to the experience lot. But they did it and they got away with it, so I don't really like that. 
perhaps as a way of getting it out of his system. Noel, with the help of girlfriend Carol, has spent more than a decade preparing to go into print, detailing how Noel had suffered by the experience. But though he no longer worked with Noel, Chaz Chandler didn't think that was a very good idea. Myself and Carol and the girlfriend were going to put a book out, which we've done a lot, as you can see, sort of investigating. I was told I'd get my head blown off. So that's not very um, helpful. <laughs> I never warned him from my point of view. Uh, he was telling me, I'd seen him in London somewhere, and he was telling us how he was going to do this, that, and the other with a book, and how he was going to do, you know, expose this and the other. And I says, well, you know, I says, there's some very heavy people involved. I says, he's talking about large sums of money. And I says, lives can get cheap in America. I says, just think what you're doing before you do it, because it's going to be, might be some crackpot over there, might uh, take offence. And uh, the sort of rumours I've heard around on the estate is not very nice people that run it. But looking back over the whole saga, it's a pretty sorry one, isn't it? Uh, well, I think the music was glorious, but uh, the situation that occurred with the band isn't uncommon in the record industry. Uh, I think you have to remember that the, invariably the musicians that make it big, and when I talk big, I mean very big, uh, they're usually young people from no particular schooling background, uh, they've got no experience of what happens when a group gets big, and they end up partying too much, drinking too much, and listening to far too many people who are way wiser in the way of the world than themselves, and they get dragged off in all directions. It takes a very strong character to survive it. They're right for ripples, in other words. Uh, that's for sure. I'll say so.